Hello, and welcome to the conversation. I'm Kelly, the head of product marketing for Times, and I'm excited to be sitting down here with Lucas Cantor, IT systems engineer at Intercom. Lucas and I had the pleasure of meeting last fall, I think it was, for a case study about Intercom, and we enjoyed the conversation so much that we decided we wanted to have it live again with y'all and share a bit more about how Lucas and the Intercom team were able to really develop a IT automation center of excellence. Um, but before we get stuck into all the goods of that story, um, I'll let you introduce yourself, Lucas. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, as Kelly said, I'm Lucas Cantor. I'm a staff engineer on the IT infrastructure team here at Intercom, and we use Times uh, as what we call our business process automation platform. So not just for IT, but to provide a, a platform for the entire company throughout Intercom to automate their processes, and, and we've really been enjoying it. I'm glad to be here today to talk about it. Yeah, excited for everyone to get to hear your story. Um, probably to kick things off, I find it really interesting to hear how different people describe um, Tynes to the different teams in their organization or sharing within even their own team what we do or what you're doing with us. Um, can you quickly describe for folks on the call what Tynes is in your mind for your team? Sure, yeah. So in my mind, uh, as I alluded to before, um, obviously, I I kind of have two roles, right? So I, I use Times as a builder because our IT team enjoys using it to automate our own processes, but we also uh, see Times, you know, from the admin side of things. So um, we build it out as a platform that is robust and secure and reliable for the rest of the company to use. And so there are a lot of, um, you know, priorities that I have uh, that are different depending on which perspective I'm coming from, for sure. And Times allows it uh, to be, you know, very trivial for us to align those priorities regardless of which perspective. Awesome. That's great to hear. Thank you for that. And what is, I remember when we were first talking, you guys obviously moved over from a different platform before you had automation in place. But that first call you had with us, um, with our solutions engineer, you had a workflow that you'd been working on for like two months, right? And you were able to build that in about two hours with us. Can you tell the team a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think assuming we're talking about the same flow here, because we were building a lot all at the same time, which <laughs> is a good thing. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, this was probably one of the ones where before, um, I'm, I guess I'll just say we're, we're using Mercado, which frankly is great and they have a great reputation, um, but they definitely... I would say they prioritize attacking things from like a chatbot first perspective, which I think works well in a lot of circumstances, but for our automations, um, it perhaps wasn't ideal. And um, with Tynes offering Tynes pages, uh, I think we were able to really sort of shift the perspective of the way we built this automation. Um, and it, uh, I mean, it, it just drastically simplified it both for the builders, but as well as for the users, because when you're using a chatbot, even as an end user, you kind of have to know the correct incantation, right? Like to to say, <laughs> talk to it. Um, whereas when you look at a web page, like everything, you, what you see is what you get. Literally, it's right in front of you in plain English. So, yeah, yeah, those pages is probably one of my favorite features in Tines. Like as a less technical user, you can just do so much more <laughs> through yeah. a page than you can when you're having to configure a chatbot. Um, and so then after the POC, obviously you chose Tines and. It's been a great experience so far, <laughs> but what was it like before that? Like when you were using Mercado, we all know Mercado is a leader yeah. in the space. Um, and just what was different? Like what what maybe was more complicated there and is less complicated yeah. here? I know you talked about pages, but um, yeah, how are you managing those requests that were coming into you? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there were definitely two considerations or two main considerations uh, that we had in mind when we were moving away from Mercado to Times and. One of them, I think for me as an engineer, I, I prioritized personally a little bit more, which was the change control system, um, mm -hmm. because I was effectively responsible for maintaining like a self-managed change control system for Workado. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, we were sort of early adopters of that and it was very mm, uh, finicky maybe isn't the right word, but just, you know, it was fragile perhaps. So I, I had to constantly babysit it and make sure it was working properly. Whereas with Tynes, like it's just a, a first class native feature built into the platform and I can literally never think about it again once I configure it the way I want it, which is awesome. Um, and then the other consideration probably that was top of mind for us was just the cost model. Um, so again, 
you know, th maybe are different priorities depending on different use cases for all these platforms. But for us, we found that before we moved to Times, we IT was kind of forced to be the arbiter of like whether somebody's task deserved an automation because we had to worry about the cost that we would incur just to automate something. Yeah. And, you know, we don't want to get in between the builders and what they're trying to build, right? Like they know best about their team's processes. So we want to just give them free reign, obviously like with set up some reasonable constraints and make it safe, but then let them, you know, run wild and automate what they want. Yeah. Um, and we found we, we couldn't do that before because we're always worried about costs, but with times just the cost model worked differently and it, it aligned more closely with, uh, you know, our philosophy of, of building in general. Right. Because it, at Intercom, like you're saying, you're, you're trying to make it where more members of the organization are able to actually come in and build and you're not necessarily yeah. holding the reins there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we're trying to definitely uh, foster this culture of builders. Um, we even sort of tongue in cheek, but kind of not. Um, we, we call this our no code as code program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we want to, uh, you know, like I said, set up this platform in times where people can quote unquote for free, get all of the engineering best practices that we might take for granted as engineers who work, you know, in code quote unquote every day. Um, so, you know, they get, you know, change management, uh, versioning, reverting to known good versions, like all of our infrastructure's code best practices that we, when we go with other coding languages, they, they get all of that for free in times as well. Yeah. And how many, how did you go about bringing those different teams into the, into the product? How did you talk to them to get them interested? I mean, a lot of folks are engineers and they don't really want to yeah. walk away from code. Um, well, I would, I mean, there definitely, there, there was already an appetite for automation and, and we could see that. I mean, people refer to this as like shadow IT sometimes. So there were already, even before we were on Mercado, we had like other non-managed platforms like Zapier, for example, where people were building things because to them, like, you know, they had a task and they were just going to follow the path of, of least friction to get that task done. And so I think that's sort of necessary, but not sufficient, right? You have to have that, that, that pent up demand, but then you also have to have a healthy culture of, of doing things the right way. And so the alignment, you know, that we can find with times is the ability to make the easy way the right way. Right. So right. We, can, we can entice them kind of look how much easier this is to do with times. Like they don't care that it's also more secure and follows all these engineering best practices. Like they just want to get their job done, but it's great when like everybody wins, you know? Yeah. I love how you said that. Yeah, exactly. They don't even know that it's secure and it's doing all these things. It's just helping them get their job done. Yeah. So did you guys do any type of internal roadshow or anything like that to get them excited? Or was it mostly just like, here's a product, see what we did with it and you can do it too. Yeah. We, um, so we have, uh, and this is just sort of, again, part of Intercom's culture of, um, I forget what we call this. I think like ship to learn, maybe it might fall under, but we have a program called show and tell where every week, and we literally just actually had this week right before this uh, call happened. Oh, nice. Uh, where every week people demonstrate something that they have built. Um, and it, you know, there's no like strict requirements, like how technical or complicated or big it is. It's all like very, it could be a beta rough around the edges. Like you don't even need slides. You might just be sharing your screen and showing something you built. So we demonstrated um, some stuff that we built on Dines and showed how easy it was. And and we also showed the the effective net benefit for the end users, right? They're like, because we use Dines, not only was our job so much easier to build this automation, but look, now you, excuse me, now you, everybody else in the company, can use this tool, like, because we, we built, I think this was a times page, for example. So we built something for anybody to, to go to that times page and then, you know, make their life easier. Yeah. That's awesome. I love those. I, I feel like I've heard that from a few of our customers too, where they've gotten to a point where they're able to just do these, yeah, like show and tell is like you're saying and say like, here, look, experience it on the one side and then also pull it through and go look and see what, how we built it on the back end, yeah. which is really neat that y'all are doing that and seeing a lot of success with it too but you're still an engineer. So how do you ensure you and your engineering colleagues are still getting to do what you want and enjoy doing it? Yeah, um, I, to be honest, I kind of think about this question the other way around because engineers, their time and, and bandwidth is, is like a limited resource. And the entire reason that we're using a platform like this is so that they're not the bottleneck. And so in a way, Times is actually freeing up engineers to work more on the like very technical work um, that they might have not been able to because they've been forced to 
you know, automate something else for a different team. So now that their time is freed up, they can use times to do things that are highly technical, maybe that they couldn't before. And, and one recent example for the IT team of this um, was how we actually use times to integrate at a very low level, like for, for database management. Um, so in, in the Tynes story builder itself, you know, again, it's so that same very straightforward dragging and dropping of, of the actions, but like under the hood, we're getting very raw, low level, like SQL query stuff going on. Like it's, it, it's really impressive and we're really pushing it to the limit, I think. Oh, that's awesome. How do you mean you're pushing it to the limit? So within your team or just even Tynes pushing Tynes to the limit? Um, I, not just my team. I, th I think uh, there are several teams that are using times in a way. And, and I think maybe an, another way to phrase this would be like, <laughs> um, you know, so I wouldn't say like times can't do this, but this is an example of um, where we've, you know, been very bleeding edge and, and like taking times as far as I can go. And then we've partnered with times to, you know, help us sort of get more out of it. So um, I mean, we just had a call recently with several engineers and product managers and our account manager um, around like how we can uh, just just process more events that than times is even used to seeing because like that that's really what our builders want it, it's just like even more of that <laughs> so like they're they're hitting the limits um, and again maybe that's not a good thing <laughs> but but um, maybe it's yeah outside of the realm of like our existing use cases of like how we're, how people have used times, you're doing it in a way that hasn't been used before. So we're just having to maybe iterate on our product. Yeah. So yeah. That and, and that's the really, thing yeah. is, is times is like super receptive. Like when we show these new use cases, like you guys are eager to, okay, like we can build on, on top of what we already have to make this work for you. And you have, which has yeah. been amazing. Yeah. You guys have been a big part of, I think a lot of how we've iterated on not only some of the usability bits, I guess, but also I think really in that change control and change management space, because yeah. so many teams who we haven't necessarily had a huge customer base from before are using the product and are used to those types of commits or those types of regulations. That's been one right. of the things, right? You guys were the key people in that, I feel like. Yeah, that was one of the um, the sort of deciding factors for, for us to start using Tynes was the ability to to enforce that as a policy worldwide. Um, and then in addition to just change control as policy, there's other things that are surrounding that, like, you know, custom role management, for example, um, because we, you know, have to be able to provision people in a very granular permission matrix of like, well, you're allowed to edit stories, but you can't, you know, necessarily approve changes or override the approval request requirement. Like, um, and yeah, there's been a lot of flexibility there and, and, and growth in the platform. Yeah. It's it's interesting as as like you have more people in the product itself, how that need for that granularity and how it differs so much from like how you might need it versus a different customer. And so those types of customer roles are essential, I feel like. Um, so it's been a really cool evolution. What's an area you've been particularly keen for us to iterate on? Honestly, it's frankly what we literally just discussed is like figuring out how we can use times to execute even more events more frequently, as well as getting even more granular with the custom permissions matrix of all the role-based access. Um, yeah. Those are, I think, the two things that have been most top of mind recently, but there's been lots of stuff that we have prioritized in the past that that has been done, um, which is what I was going to talk about next, is the, um, the change control policy didn't exist initially, but you built that for us effectively. Um, custom roles also didn't exist. You built that for us. Skim user provisioning is actually really big for us. That's important um, because we want Okta to be, you know, the authoritative source of truth in terms of who's authorized to access what role. That's so. That's how the products evolved over the last year. And then, what's been the most unexpected? Like, what what would you say is the most unexpected way you guys have used the product or an unexpected feature where you're getting added benefit? Um. Well, the unexpected feature, I think that took me most by surprise, like I say, as a, as a nerd kind of would be the curl to times. And I know that's such a tiny little thing, but when I saw it, it was just so delightful. <laughs> um, and because there are so many, you know, API documentation libraries out there where you'll have curl examples of how to use their API. And you don't need times to have this pre-built custom bespoke integration for that one <laughs> vendor. Like you can just copy and paste a curl command into a time story and it's done. Um, that was so cool. Um, but an unexpected way in which we've used it. Hmm. 
Um, again, this is probably like an ex this may be a good example of like what Tynes itself didn't have in mind when they built the platform, but a way that we've used it is um, we've used it to expand on capabilities of other core tools that we use in our environment, like even Google Workspace, for example. Um, we have very strict security policies around OAuth integrations for our Google Workspace environment, which is probably not surprising. Um, but occasionally, if we want to allow list, you know, an OAuth client to integrate with our Google Workspace, it'll make sense for us to allow it, but only for specific users. But Google doesn't let you do that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. They only allow you to allow list it either for the whole company or maybe for org units, but you can't get as granular as like users or groups. So we built a time story. Um, that uh, I think it just ingests like a webhook from the Google security logs of auth grants. Yeah. And then it compares them against authorizations in Okta. And if somebody has not been authorized, it revokes that OAuth uh, token effectively immediately. And then it slacks them. And again, it helps people self-solve. It sends them a link to where they can go to uh, to request basically that may be added to the allow list of users who, who commit that integration. Um, so that's not like strictly a security incident. I mean, it is definitely security related for sure. Right. Uh, right, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very IT dev SecOps, like all in one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's interacting with so many systems. That's really cool. What do you have others like that where you where you where you've gone outside the traditional TINZ security space? Yeah, um, I would say definitely the the biggest, most complicated story that we built that I think was most technically impressive that was not like a traditional security. Uh, application would be employee lifecycle management. Um, so we obviously have Workday, right? That's our HR authoritative source of truth. And we have Okta, which is the identity and access management single sign-on authorization tool. And while they do have a native integration between them, um, it just is only built in a way that you have to implicitly trust the data coming from Workday. And we wanted to make sure that we could sanitize and, and double check and validate all that data. And so we were able to sort of put times in between both of them and then also connect the, build our own database of, of like what the authoritative source of truth for all the user attributes was in Redshift. And so that was what I was referring to earlier when I was saying um, we built like a send a story that it just allows us to input a SQL query that will be sent via the AWS API to this Redshift database. Um, so that was really impressive and complicated. Uh, that that's actually something that we built. I said we <laughs> we worked with an engineer at Times to build, um, and that was part of the procurement process. Um, it's just really complex, definitely IT specific, not security, and and just fun, frankly. Oh, I love that. Just fun. That's what we want. It's got to be yeah. fun to be building as well. Is there any? Anything else like around what you guys have built that's been helping you with that center of excellence that we should be making sure the rest of the group knows? I I would say, and again, this might sort of reveal what my priorities are like as an IT and security focused individual, but um, one of the things that I, and again, this is a new feature that you built for us at our request was the ability to have credentials that uh, have like dedicated prod versus test versions. So, mm -hmm. One of the best practices that we like to not only foster, but enforce ideally is don't use production credentials in a test story <laughs> and, and people will follow the path of least resistance. Right. And they will just do that. Um, yeah. But uh, now that you can set up a single credential, but have sort of inside of it nested prod and test versions that will automatically be applied to like when a story runs in test, it uses the test version of the credential. So the end user or rather the builder, I guess, um, they don't need to, you know, worry about accidentally breaking something, you know, by, by using a production credential when they're testing. Nice. Um, we don't want that to happen. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, it's a really important best practice and it's the kind of thing that not everybody thinks about, but it's the kind of thing that for me, it keeps me up at night, but now I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. I'm sure it keeps other people up at night too. <laughs> <laughs> It's not going to just be you worrying about that, um, but maybe just within um, your world right now. Um, I wanted to pause for a sec and make sure there was something we had talked about before. Because I know you guys have obviously, 
you weren't creating this culture of automation just when you started using Tynes. You've been doing this the whole time. And I want to make sure, to, do you feel like we talked about that enough or were we really, or was Tynes really the catalyst for this? Um, I, I wouldn't say Tynes is the catalyst. I would say Tynes sort of like, it, it unblocked a lot of that latent demand though, for sure. Okay. Because that was the point. Is like we had people doing this the wrong way before. <laughs> yeah. And it allowed us to to make the easy path forward for them, also the secure path. Okay. Um. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think we discussed that. I think that's. I I really like that. That's right. Yeah. The um. You're building things. You're having fun, and you don't even realize it's secure, and <laughs> it's following right. all the best practices, right? Yeah. It's like when you trick your kids into eating their vegetables. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. What about, um, obviously I would imagine governance and compliance is probably like the key benefit of consolidating all these different automation systems into one. Um, but what about like, I know with, with intercom and the way you were doing it before you were kind of in a position where you had a bunch of smaller stories or workflows that you then, when you came over to times, you're able to move them into one workflow instead of having like 15. Yeah. What, like in terms of consolidating in that regard, like what's the main benefit of that? Like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. That was something we're very happy to see. Um, and again, depending on who you ask, so we'll give you a different answer. Somebody like a financial controller will say, well, we're only paying for one story instead of a dozen. So that's great. Uh, <laughs> for me, I think um, it makes it easier for the builders um, because they don't have to wrap their head around, you know, passing logic and information back and forth between all of these stories. Um, they can sort of see it all laid out in front of them visually and intuitively. Like the algorithm is the automation. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it, 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 even for like logging, right? Like when you're, maybe you're troubleshooting something or iterating on what you've built and it's easy to just stay in the same story to look through, you know, your test logs, for example, all in one place. Um, and then I think, uh, that also, uh, it helps us get around, uh, limitations on recursion, not being supported in other platforms that we've had in the past too. Um, so basically because certain vendors don't support recursion, we would have to like build essentially duplicates of the same story that would like pass data back and forth to each other. It's like trick it into doing recursion. Uh, and you know, when you're doing that, you're like fighting the tool that you're working with, that you know that there's a problem, you know? So it's yeah. nice to not have to do that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you don't want, like when your systems aren't playing nicely, it just creates all kinds yeah. of friction. <laughs> um, I think I would also say, I, I mean, you touched on this very briefly, just consolidating all, all these automation into a single platform and times, it not only does it make it easier for, you know, any one builder to automate something, but when one team needs to integrate one of their systems with a system that's owned by another team, if they're already both set up with um, credentials and times, like we can pass that data, you know, between those systems much easier. Um, we don't have to worry about onboarding, you know, another vendor or proofing like API scope, et cetera. Like um, if we trust times with it, then, you know, and they're already both in times, then the security audit is done in my opinion. Yeah. Imagine, I imagine that just has such a faster um, turnaround time on those requests. Like usually as the person asking IT all the time, can I have this tool? Can I get access to this system? Um, if at companies, when I wasn't at times, it take it would take a long time. You'd have to wait, like you said, for a security audit or something like that. And then to wait for someone to help you integrate the tool and like set up the right. platform with all the different protocols. So I imagine, yeah, teams are a lot happier <laughs> now. Yeah, that that's nice. We like being able to say yes, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, the teams themselves, for the most part, like they're the ones who own these systems throughout the company. Most systems are not owned by IT itself. So like, they're the owners, they're the subject matter experts, like they know how best to automate things. Like we're just there to make sure that there's a secure platform. And, you know, once Tynes has been vetted once, like the job is done. How many teams do y'all have on Tynes today? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, I, not a ton. I, th I think we were licensed for only like 10, so less than that. Um, I'm not sure, probably yeah. between five and 10. That's and we've, really we've definitely, we've made teams that are not 
super granular, right? Because people through like larger organizations, like departments, for example, okay. might want to use Tynes. And it, it logically makes sense for us to say, okay, well, we'll make a team in Tynes for this entire like sales department. And then that way, smaller teams within sales, they can interact with each other in that sales department team in Tynes. If we wanted to, or if we perhaps had a obligation to, you know, segregate all of these teams in a very granular way, then we might have the same number of automations that we have today, but maybe, you know, twice as many teams or, or more. Um, but luckily, yeah, we haven't needed that many teams. Oh, that's nice. But it's nice that you're able to still bring all those folks into the platform because you have those granular roles. So you're not worried about anyone that breaking anything or, or exactly moving things around that they shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And did you want to show a story today? I couldn't remember. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to show um, the same story we talked about before in the case study that we did. I think maybe that is because that I, I know that one's approved to show public place. So. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, let's let's look at one of your stories and, and give the folks a, a view into just how intuitive it has been for you and how it's easy for someone to consume. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm happy to just walk through this story and, and show the example. So this is a perfect example of how we have multiple entry points, right? So we have multiple web hooks. So one, when the CrowdStrike detection itself happens, it starts this, uh, chain of actions. And then there's also, um, you know, that'll send a Slack message to the user, depending on the detection. And then depending on how the user responds to that Slack message, it'll push a button in it. And then it'll be this other separate entry point through this action. Uh, but again, you can see it all laid out in front of you in a single story, which is great. Um, and this is probably our simplest example of multiple entry points. Um, I mean, I'm happy to even walk through step by step, but basically um, we're setting up some environment variables uh, that, you know, just help us parameterize how to integrate with GitHub, for example, and Slack. Um, and then we're just checking to... Um, to only continue if if the event is of a certain type and has certain characteristics. Then we're looking up that endpoint in CrowdStrike, uh, and then we're looking up that same asset in Nitsa for inventorying purposes to find the users assigned to you. And we're creating an issue in GitHub, uh, and then we're posting a message to our IT channel uh, in Slack. Um, and then we're also um, doing some logic here to determine if the asset is assigned to a user and if it's low priority, then um, if that if those are both true, we'll find that user in Slack by their email address and then we'll Slack that user if they're found. And then the user can respond to that Slack message, which brings us back up here. Um, and then um, we remove the buttons from the Slack message because obviously we only want them responding a single time per incident. And the button, uh, Basically, there'll be two options: the buttons, depending on the incident um, severity. So, if it's if it's what we categorize as like lower than P1, for example, in CrowdStrike, then we give the user the opportunity to say, "Oh, like actually, this was just me. Like this is expected," and then we don't worry about it. But if they escalate it, then we just keep the incident as is. We update the GitHub issue and we let the user know that that's been taken care of. But I think here is. Um, yeah, uh, assuming that they did escalate it, right? We're going to continue. Okay, so let's know that it's been escalated. We'll comment on the GitHub issue to, to update that it's been escalated. Label it accordingly because okay, it needs to be escalated. We'll label it as such, um, and then we're going to find the pager duty schedule. I think this is. Oh, actually, you know what? I think we since we published this, we moved from pager duty to incident IO, but it's the same kind of logic. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm pretty sure this has been updated for incident.io, but same, same concept. Um, and then we, we get the incident.io on call schedule. Yeah, there it is. Get user on call from yeah. incident.io. And um, through some event transform actions, we compose an incident summary and create an incident in incident.io. And then we send a Slack message about it as well in IT general. Yeah. Uh, as well Wait, as so direct user. So out of curiosity, how... Um... How long was the process? How long would it have taken you to move over to incident.io from pager duty before and now in times? How quickly were you able to do it? Um, I mean, it's hard to say because we definitely we didn't do it before moving to times. Um yeah. but I think I, what I can say um confidently is that before times, the answer would be it depends. Right. Okay. Um 
So it depends on, is there like a, a pre-built integration, for instance, with Dio in this other platform? If right. the answer is yes, then it might be quick. Quick. If not, then it could be more complicated. Um, right. But um, I don't know, time's just, everything is just, you know, an API call effectively. Like if you can write a curl command, then you can make an action in times. Yeah. So things are, actions can be like fungible in a way. Um, yeah, and in any event, um, that's what the story looks like. I can... Uh, and then it's updating both Slack, like it's updating the Slack threads that you started as well. Yeah. As the individual user in Slack. And it's making sure GitHub's all aligned with what you've done as well. Yep. Yeah. So it's Slack, GitHub, Incident.io, uh, also integrating with CrowdStrike itself, obviously, to get the alert and to get metadata about the endpoint, uh, as well as Unitsa to get um, who it's assigned to. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of integrations in a tight little story. Yeah. That's I was, I was surprised at um, how many in such a small space. That's awesome, though, because it seems like it's helpful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and the whole point is right to, Helpful is exactly the word to use here because it, it's significantly reducing the noise, right, in, in that signal noise ratio. Like, so when we do get an alert and it is escalated, we know that it's real instead of creating that notification fatigue where everybody's just so used to seeing these alerts all the time, they just ignore them and they're trained to ignore them even when it is a real incident. Right. Um, and I think that, that really is the overarching goal of this particular story, right? It's like make it so when you get an alert, you know that it's worth applying to. Right. Gosh, makes an impact. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you for that. That was really nice um, to get to see and hear and understand um, how you guys are doing this. And hopefully it's relatable to other people on the call as well. Yeah, I think so, for sure. Um, it seems like something a lot of people deal with is like that alert fit. I mean, even personally, you know, the alert fatigue when yeah. you have just too many, too many things coming in at once. And it's like, which one of these actually matters right now? Yeah, you definitely don't want to train your users to ignore important alerts, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, 100%. All right, folks, we're going to head straight into the Q&A now. If you don't mind, put your questions into the little question box there on your screen, and we'll be happy to answer any of them as they come through. Awesome. Um, so it looks like we have um, a couple coming through already. One of them was asking about how they're they're using Tynes for some of their IT use cases, and their strategy is kind of similar to yours, Lucas. It sounds like where one of their questions was, "How are you approaching documentation for your more complicated workflows? Is the workflow itself the living documentation, or do you have anything with export and or save as image, for example?" This is a really good question, um, and uh, I think this. Question probably came in before we demoed that last story. So maybe uh, in the screen sharing, you, you might have seen there's a little bit of documentation in there. And um, you know, we, we make sometimes heavy use of the notes functionality uh, to you know, right alongside the actions to add a note describing what things do. Um, that's maybe depends on who you ask. I mean, me personally, I'm a strong proponent, uh, sorry, proponent of um, like documentation as code as well. So like the code should be the documentation, it should be self-explanatory. Um, but yeah, as, as stories get more complicated, that'll only get you so far. Uh, we haven't used the ability to export stories as images yet. I think that's really cool. Um, I mean, we've obviously we've done analogous like flowcharts with algorithms before for our other documentation. So I, it's a good reminder. Maybe we should start doing that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the good news is you know, Times has lots of options. So um, whatever we need. Thanks. All right. Let's pick a different, another one. Um, so you might've already answered this a little bit, but what are processes that you've built in play or put in place that give you the confidence for this no code developer community that you've built internally? Yeah, a very good question. Um, and I definitely will go back to just reiterating again, like at Intercom, there, there definitely is this strong, healthy engineering culture uh, that focuses on these very security minded best practices. Um, and I mean, to be frank, when we were first investigating Tynes and you know, decided initially not to get it before we ended up migrating to Tynes, like there were a couple of those uh, best practices that Tynes didn't support yet. But like over the course of that next year, you really sort of met us in the middle and, and really built all of these things out for us to allow us to um, e effectively enforce those practices. So I, I, you know, I just mentioned, rattle them off again off the top of my head, you know, role-based access control, least privilege, 
um, you know, a granular permissions, custom roles. Um, maybe one of the things I haven't discussed yet would be like a specific example might be um, you built for us the ability for us to carve out a specific permission for credential management. So, um, you know, we want to be able to, for example, have IT or the owners of times, we manage the credentials and set them up for users. And that's like part of the process of onboarding a new vendor to integrate with times. Uh, but once that's done, then the users can use those credentials when they're building stories to do literally whatever they want. It's like a sandbox, they have free reign. Um, so yeah, I mean, times has shown just an incredible amount of flexibility and willingness to, like I said, meet us in the middle and, and, and build out the functionality we need for those best practices. Awesome, I love to hear that. <laughs> um, another one is around um, that you mentioned other people are building automations um, with you. So who else is building with you mm -hmm. on your team? Uh, yeah, on my team, um, I guess the short answer would be everybody. <laughs> Um, That's awesome. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we have three engineers, myself included, and we're all uh, building automation sometimes frequently. Um, but we do also have other non-engineering folks on the IT infrastructure team, um, you know, managers, TPM, stuff like that. And they have also spent time working in times. Uh, and that's, you know, what's so nice about it is like, it's, it's not just a tool for engineers, but if you are an engineer and very technically minded, you can get really low level and, and, you know, as deep as you need in whatever technical tasks you have. That's awesome. Um, all right, looks like we got we have one more here um, on how are you or how do you manage on call shifts and incidents if everyone is building at the same time? Huh. Um, well, I would say really I would turn this question on its head. I would say frankly, not everyone is building at the same time, <laughs> um, but Times really is what enables us to do that, right? So like if we didn't have times, we would be forced to be building all the time. And then we would really be out of luck because we would also have other responsibilities, right? right. So like something we have to go in the back burner and something, you know, something still does go in the back burner, but at least like times allows us, like, I don't think there's really such thing as a 10X engineer, but like times kind of allows you to pretend like you're a 10X engineer. <laughs> um, you, know, you get some of those benefits perhaps. Um, and yeah, we have all sorts of other responsibilities and processes that we can do without being stuck automating because times, you know, makes things 10 times as fast. Oh, nice. Love that. That's what we want to hear from everybody <laughs> who's using it. So that's great. Um, I'm not sure if we, if we want to give everyone just another second or two to see if any more questions come through, but it might be, might be the end there. Um, awesome. Well, thanks everyone who is able to join us today um if you have other questions that you come up with or you have for us oh wait one more just slid in let's see uh, uh, do you okay so the question is um it's very cool you have different teams and team types do you do anything beyond the times created training for enabling folks to build in times for example i've been curious about creating private templates for shared use and wondering if you use those or anything similar hmm. Um, we have built internal templates. Um, like for example, I mentioned earlier, we, we made like a, or even a send a story, like to send SQL queries via the AWS API. Um, I don't think we've built any that we've like put in a library for other teams to use or, or that maybe we have, and I'm just ignorant of it. <laughs> uh, but not myself personally, yet. but that's a really good idea. Um, one thing that I did, and, and I'm, I'm just going to mention here on the call. <laughs> is um, I, I asked, because I think that the Tynes University is very useful. And so we, we do have like an internal Tynes user guide. And whenever we, as, as part of our access um, request platform, when someone requests access to Tynes, when we grant it, we also send them to our internal Tynes user guide, which also mentions Tynes University. And we say, like, please make sure you complete at least one course in Tynes University. And I've uh, internally told our team at times, like, I would love it if I could force people to complete a Times University course before they're even allowed to build in our Times work. But um, you, you haven't done that for us yet. I, uh, maybe it's a little controversial, but. <laughs> you can always create a workflow to do that, right? You can always build a story that could gate. I'm sure, you, yeah, you could like take people out of a team, like if they don't have proof of completing Times University, <laughs> like upload your certificate here. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's such a good resource that I found the university to be, even how I learned about, like learned how yeah. to use signs. It's, it's really approachable. All right, let's see. Someone might be typing something up for us. It's good questions here today. I feel like that's been fun. Um, being mindful of time though, I'm gonna go ahead and call it, but cause um, we really appreciate everyone who's able to join today. We love the questions. I know I did, I'm sure Lucas, that, that was fun for you as well. Yeah. And we hope um, to do more of this in the future. So thank you so much, Lucas, for your time and for your experience. It's been great to My share. Pleasure. Yeah, it was really fun. Love talking about times, just talking shop. It's the best, same. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good day.